tell you all a story this morning. There was a young farmer who was out in his field tending to his crop when he looked up in the sky and he saw a very strange and interesting cloud formation. And what he saw were three letters clearly depicted in the clouds. Those letters were G, P, and C. And this young, pre- this young farmer took those to be a calling from God that he was to go preach Christ. So he rushed off to his church leadership and insisted that he had been called into ministry. Well, respectful of his zeal, they wanted to go ahead and invite him to preach that coming Sunday morning. So when Sunday finally came, the sermon was very long and tedious and virtually incoherent. And when it finally ended, the church leadership sat stunned in silence, much like you are now. Until one elder finally spoke up and whispered in the young farmer's ear and said, You know, I think those uh, clouds may have been really saying, go plant corn. (laughs) If God's calling really happened that way, it wouldn't be the first time that there was some confusion about what it meant to be called into ministry. When I was younger, I thought that I knew what this young farmer also supposed, that I was being called into ministry work and that I was being called to, to preach. See, I grew up in a ministry family. I grew up in the church, and my dad was a preacher. And so I thought that my career was going to be spent being behind the pulpit every Sunday. It took me a little longer to more fully understand that calling and what God was truly calling me to in ministry. And while it is true that I do feel called to ministry work, to kingdom work, I don't expect that you'll be seeing me up here on stage every Sunday or or even very often. And I say that because a calling to ministry is a lot more than being a preacher or an elder. So what is a calling? Well, commonly, we like to explain that a life's calling, someone's calling, is something that you are passionate about, something that gets you out of bed every day. Simon Sinek, a leadership speaker and author whom I listen to and read, refers to this as an organization's or an individual's why the why behind their actions or behaviors. Typically, we talk about someone's career as being the, uh, how they identify themselves to others. We, we even try to kind of speculate or infer things about what, we, uh, what they might do or who they might be based on their job. We try to assume things based on their what, what they do. But a calling is much like a why, It's not about what you're called to do, it's why you do it. A calling or a call is far more than a hobby or something that you are passionate about. A calling is what your life's work is directed toward. We can see plenty of examples throughout history and in popular culture of people who have found their calling or uh, their call in a cause or belief. Today we're going to look at some popular examples from scripture that depict how God called on some people to do his work and what their response was. There is a common misconception about callings. Most people think that a calling is something they love or are passionate about. Unfortunately, if that's your assumption, I have some bad news for you. You aren't always going to like or enjoy what you're being called to do. Or more specifically, you may not like the decisions and tasks that come into that calling. I can think of a few examples from the Old Testament. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 3. The first example we're going to look at today is Moses. Moses was called to represent and to lead his people, the Israelites, out of Egypt and then through the wilderness into the promised land. Let's look at the description of his calling. Exodus 3, verse 1. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to, the, to Sinai, the mountain of God. Moses sounds like he's got a pretty comfortable life. He's tending the, uh, his father-in-law's flocks, and his father-in-law is the priest of a region, which means he's pretty well-respected, possibly even wealthy. And maybe Moses himself isn't sitting pretty, 
but he obviously has some responsibility to his family and to his adopted tribe. Verse 2. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from above, or from, sorry, from a, uh, the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. God will often do something to catch our attention. When he needs us to make a decision, he makes sure that our attention is on him. He may put someone into our life or remove someone from our life. He may change our circumstances for the good or the not so good. He may show us circumstances around us and cause them to change our thinking. Whatever God uses to get our attention, subtle or obvious, like a burning bush, he will make sure that you hear him. Verse 3. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. Here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. God gets Moses' attention and then immediately establishes his right and authority for this afternoon intrusion. Verse 7. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. The command, now go. God is telling Moses, leave Midian and go face your old family, your old king, and tell them that you are taking your real people and leaving Egypt. Whoa. Now that's a pretty tall order for Moses. Can you imagine what might be going through his mind? God, you want me to tell Pharaoh what? I don't know if you've met him, but he and I grew up together. And I know what he's like when he doesn't get his morning cup of coffee. Moses sets straight to putting the brakes on this situation. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? Moses was not liking this idea. He was not sure that he could even do it. He even thought he had some pretty good excuses. First he told God, No one will believe me. So God blessed him with the gift of miraculous signs to prove that God was with him. Then he told God, but I'm not a good speaker. So God told him to let him, his brother Aaron speak for him. He even told God, you've got the wrong guy. Wow. Have you ever told God that he was wrong? Think about it. At some point in our lives, we have all said something very similar to what Moses has said to God. I know I have said numerous times on numerous occasions, God, I can't handle this. I can't do this. Find someone else. We even try to use Moses' same excuses sometimes. Well, I can't talk to someone about church stuff because they won't believe me. Well, I don't know how to answer all of their questions, so I can't talk to them about the gospel. But the problem for Moses and the problem for all of us is that God picked us. God picked Moses to lead his people back to freedom. Maybe God is calling you to serve others in your community. Maybe he's calling you to serve in the church more. Maybe he's calling you to be a better spouse or a better parent. Maybe he's calling you into a life of ministry. That's what it was for me. From a very early age, I knew on some strange 
weird level that I was being called into ministry work. I grew up a preacher's kid, and I saw the ugly side of being in a ministry family that no one talks about. I experienced, by extension, the stress and emotional baggage of being in ministry. I experienced my dad being overworked at the church, being taken advantage of at times, being gossiped about, and not being supported by his eldership or his associate ministers. Through all of my experience uh, with the church, negative or positive, being hurt or rejected by fellow Christians, numerous times I gave up on this idea. And I said, God, this is not for me. I need you to find someone else. And God said to me, okay, Chris, go ahead. I understand. Don't worry about it. No, he didn't say that. He never said that to me. He didn't let me off that easily. He has been very, very patient with me. And he has worked on me and in me and prepared me for the last 10 years for this day and forward. I may have told God no and thought that I was walking away from his plan for me. But in reality, I was just taking another turn that would bring me right back to the destination that God had in store for me. Many twists and turns into and out of and back into the idea of being in ministry kind of reminds me of the story of Jonah. Go ahead and turn to Jonah chapter 1. We're not going to spend too much time here, I promised Rick, because we're going to be talking about Jonah for our next sermon series. So uh, we're going to quickly recall some details about our friend who found himself swimming with some fishes. As much as we saw how Moses didn't want to do what God had called him to, Jonah actually went to great lengths to avoid God's calling. Jonah chapter 1 verse 2. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. He went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Right, because that really works. I mean, what is Jonah thinking? Do we really think that he could hide from God? But don't we think that often? If I ignore God's calling, he'll get bored of me and he'll go away. You know, I used to think that if I pursued something else as a career so passionately and fervently, that God would feel like my mind was made up and he'd have to find someone else. God picked you and he picked me. And no matter what it is he has called you to do, no matter how much that doesn't sound like something you have a desire to do, that is your calling. You can say no, you can quit your job and find another job, You can marry that guy or walk away from your mom. You can even find another church. It doesn't matter because God is going to lead you right back to where it is he has called you to be. He is the divine planner. He knows all and is in control of all. He knows what is best for you and he is the one who put this rock into motion. Do you really think there is anywhere you can run and hide on the face of this earth where he won't find you? Well, Jonah may have thought that he could run and hide from God, but God proved him pretty wrong. Through a violent storm and a boat full of scared sailors, one man overboard situation, and Jonah finds himself on a living submarine headed straight back toward Nineveh. So God used a set of strange circumstances to get Jonah's attention. And then he gets his thinking on straight and told him again, Jonah chapter 3, verse 3. Or verse 1 through 3. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh. And they all lived happily ever after. Not quite, but uh, we'll get to that in the coming weeks. We've looked at two examples of a bad response to God's calling. And we saw that no matter what, God still pursued them. 
So what happens when you've accepted your calling, begrudgedly or excitedly? Then what? Well, now it's time to embrace it and go all in. How do I do that? Well, like Noah. Go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. Noah was called to build a boat that would save all the different species of animals and the human race. There's an old Bill Cosby bit about Noah and the ark. Some of you may have heard it before. I, hear, I see some nods. Many maybe haven't, but the point of the bit is that God probably caught Noah pretty off guard with this whole ark thing. Can you imagine for just a moment how Noah may have felt that day? Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out with the earth. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Bring a pair of every kind of... Oh, sorry, we're going to skip down to verse 19. Bring a pair of every kind of animal a male and a female, into the boat with you to keep them alive during the flood. Pairs of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come to be kept alive. Be sure to take on board enough food for you and your family and all the animals. So here's Noah being asked to do something that doesn't make much sense to him. God, you want me to do and build what? You want me to be ridiculed by my entire community and my family. And you want me to become a zookeeper and take care of all these different and dangerous animals for you only know how long? God, I think you may have the wrong house. Well, that's how we might have responded. Our fear and discomfort may cause us to respond like that when God tells us to do something strange or uncomfortable. When we can't tell God no, and we can't run away from him and hide, then we try to bargain and compromise. We try things like, well, I'll start teaching at church more when my kids are a little older or I have more time. I'll cut the grass at church when my kids aren't playing sports. I'll volunteer to help out with the homeless ministry when my workload gets a little lighter. Really, we might as well be saying, God, I will answer your calling when and how it suits me. We really need to remember who it is we're talking to. Noah didn't bargain. He didn't compromise with God. He didn't tell God, hey, I need you to wait like five years. My wife is in a really good place with her job right now. My kids are graduating college, and I want them to get established first. And my job just gave me a promotion, and so I, I'm really busy. But if you can wait like five years, I'm totally there. No. Noah embraced the call, and he went all in. He built the ark. He went all in on his calling. We just finished a sermon series about going all in as a believer. Well, your calling is part of going all in. You know what going all in means? In a gambling game, going all in is when you have put everything on the table. When you have bet everything you have, you have put everything out there, and it is all on the line. There is nothing left to lose. Not some in, all in. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. That should be our response. To do everything exactly as God has commanded us. After telling God no numerous times, after trying to pursue different career paths and trying to take matters in my own hands and doing everything in my power to avoid God's calling, God finally won out. I was miserable in all other career ventures. I felt empty, like there was something missing inside. So I turned back to God's will and started running toward it and pursuing it. Started serving a lot here at SCC, and then I started staffing camps uh, at like Indian Lake or Delmarva. And then I found a Christian college that I wanted to go to, 
And then it was just a matter of time for my partner to be in ministry to be ready to join me. Tabby and I went to Florida Christian College to be prepared for ministry. And while we were students, God did just that. He prepared us through classes, through churches, and through other believers to do what we came home to do, which is to help lead this congregation in a pursuit of God's will for SCC. You're not always going to feel ready or qualified. I didn't. You will not always feel or think that, you have, that you're the right fit for the job. I don't. You may not be ready or qualified. And you may be, by all earthly standards, the worst possible person for the job. But God doesn't decide things by earthly standards. God doesn't make mistakes or mispicks. He doesn't get it wrong or misjudge. He doesn't reign on a high mountain, unaware of you and your situation. His son was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is not calling us to go out alone without help, without resources, direction, and information. God will provide your resources and prepare you. Maybe we aren't prepared right now for what our calling is. Maybe we don't have the resources or the knowledge yet. And if we don't have that, if we're not ready yet, we need to be proactive and go out and get that knowledge, get prepared so that we can be utilized by our king. Start asking questions. Start studying. Start talking with other believers. Go ready yourself. Some of you may be thinking, well, Chris, what if God has the wrong calling for me? Like I said, God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't choose wrong. God knows all and knows what is best. If you disagree with these concepts about God that he knows all and knows what is best, if you disagree with that, if you disagree about our creator who knew you when he knit you together in your mother's womb, the creator who knows the plans that he has for you, the plans to give you hope in a future, if you disagree with that, if you don't believe these things, then forget everything else I'm saying about your calling because that's not your problem. Your immediate problem is that you don't see God as your master. If we are truly believers who have heard the gospel message, confessed our sins to God and others, and confessed Jesus as our master and savior, and we've turned away from our sinful lifestyles, and we've been baptized in water through immersion, then how can we say, okay, but I'm not doing that? Do you understand what God being master of your life means? We always say things like, God is my Lord, but that's a title that means he's our master. For those of you who have served in our armed forces, you would probably best understand this concept by way of following orders, especially if those orders came from the commander-in-chief. And if you're an officer in the military and the President of the United States gave you or your unit an order, would you question it? Would you say, listen, Donald, I think you've got the wrong guy? I would hope not. In the military, you have sworn an oath to serve the United States of America. And you have chosen to submit to those who are above you. Well, and as a believer, you have sworn an oath to make and keep God your Lord and Master. And that means you have agreed to submit to his authority. When we look at what our calling is, we have to realize something pretty important. God loves you. He's not calling you to do something that is going to hurt you or is that, that is going to be evil or ill-fitting or that you're not suited for. He isn't mischievous in his plans. He isn't looking down from his throne, playing with your life like a mean-spirited child. He isn't, he isn't doing that because he cares about you. He wants what is best for you. And he wants success and prosperity for you in your life. But he and his will have to be followed by his servants. God is your master is not like your boss who just wants to make the numbers next quarter. Or your spouse who may be manipulative. Or your parents who never 
cared about your feelings. Just so you know, all three of those parties are in the audience today, and I don't feel that from any one of the three of them. <laughs> Just put that out there. That wasn't self-projection. He loves you so very much. He loves you so much that he gave his only son a part of himself to the earth to be separated from him, to live among us, to experience humanity, to minister to us, and to give us salvation through a torturous death. That's how much God loves you. If God was willing to do all of that because he loves you, why can't you respond to his call and do what he's asked of you? He probably hasn't asked you to go into a dangerous country or to put your life on the line. He's probably simply asked you to get up early and come serve food at winter relief. Or maybe he's called you to teach Sunday school. Maybe he is calling you to cut the grass this spring. See Clyde after service. Maybe he is calling you to be a better spouse or a better parent. Maybe he's calling you to serve in your community or at your school. Maybe he is calling you into the mission field or to maybe just go on a mission trip. Maybe he is simply calling you to talk to your coworker about him and invite them to church. Whatever God's calling for your life is, you have to be ready to accept it and embrace it and answer that call. Then you have to be ready to go all in. But you'll only be able to do those things if you believe that God is your master. And you'll only agree to that if you believe that he really and truly cares about you. God has a calling for you. It may require a little of you, and it may require everything. Either way, you need to respond like Noah, with obedience and by going all in. Stop arguing with God. I think we all know that doesn't work out very well. If you're unsure of what God's calling for your life is, here are some starting points. Prayer. Pray to God that he will lead you to your calling, that you will not be blind to his message. Pray for your burning bush. Read scripture. Read the word of God daily so that you know him better and you can understand what he may be calling you to do. And then ask. Go to a leader in the church and ask them what you can do to help or to get involved. Matthew 9.37 says, He said to his disciples, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. There is plenty of work to be done for the kingdom. There are plenty of lost souls that need to hear the gospel message. There is plenty of community service projects in the Baltimore-Annapolis area alone. There are plenty of projects in this building or on this property alone. Unfortunately, the workers are few. There just aren't enough people willing to step up and answer the call to help. God is calling you. Will you answer? God called Jesus. Earlier I mentioned that God sent his son to live on earth for a time. God called Jesus to live among mankind to experience this existence as human. Jesus lived on this earth for 33 years before, he, before his crucifixion. He experienced love and temptation, pain and loss. God called Jesus to be our sacrifice. And Jesus, though completely aware of what awaited him, he accepted his calling. His sacrifice as a sinless lamb paid the price for our sins. He was separated from God the Father in death so that in our own deaths we would not have to be. In just a moment we're going to pass a tray down your row. In the tray there is a piece of bread and a cup of juice. The bread reminds us of the physical human body that Jesus took and that was broken and scarred for us. The blood 
or the juice represents the blood of Jesus that was spilled so that we could be made new in him. We invite you to take one of each of those and remember the sacrifice of Christ. Remember the torturous beating and the excruciating crucifixion and death. But then also remember the fulfilled promise of Jesus. He said he would be put to death, he would be buried, and then in three days he would rise. And he did. As we celebrate on Easter Sunday and as we celebrate here at SCC every Sunday, let us remember him and his sacrifice and his resurrection this morning. Father, I come before you this morning thankful for a wonderful church family. They have supported me and blessed, been a blessing to me and my family, and I just ask that you would be a blessing to them. Father, this morning I thank you so much for your love and for your care for us as your creation, that you would send your son to die for us, that you would send him to be beaten and tortured, to take on our sin and shame so that we could have unity with you. Father, I ask that you would remind us constantly of your love and your sacrifice so that we can remember how much we need to respond to you. Father, I ask and pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.